So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming uh, Sekiro Hudson. Dr. Hudson's research uh, is on the divergence between descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes in the expectations for gay men and lesbian women. Uh, Dr. Hudson earned her PhD in social psychology from here at Harvard University. Um, she's beginning a postdoc at Yale University with Dr. Jennifer Richardson. And currently she's under the guidance of Dr. Jim Sedanius, Dr. Mazarin Banaji, and Dr. Mina Chikara. Um, and she's interested in two broad questions. One is, what are the psychological and biological roots of power hierarchies? And how do these hierarchies intersect to influence experiences and perceptions? Uh, we also welcome our WAP podcast community, which has downloaded our seminars over 54,000 times. And we're so pleased to have a rippling effect beyond the virtual walls of our room here. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hudson, and then we'll stop for questions um, um, halfway in. Okay, thank you so much. The reason why I'm cheesing so hard is because I just got my PhD like barely a month ago. And so I'm like super excited. So I haven't heard Dr. Hudson being said so many times uh, in, <laughs> in the space. So I'm super pumped about that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to get straight into it. So uh, the work that I'm going to present to you today is really thinking intersectionally about how we understand gender stereotypes. And I've done this work with a doctoral student, uh, I guess here at Harvard. Um, her name is uh, Usma Ghani, and she's in, this, in the lab that I'm leaving. Um, but a lot of the, some of the analyses she also did. So we're doing this in collaboration. I'm just really excited. Okay, let's make sure. So as we all know, stereotypes are pervasive forces in society. And I would say that there's no social groups uh, that are immune from being assigned these heuristics about their character, their hobbies, or their preferences. And so in the work that I'm gonna present to you today, I've really focused on stereotypes of uh, LGB people. And so decades of work has primarily understood stereotypes about uh, lesbian women and gay men from a gender inversion model or the idea that gay men and straight women are presumed to be similar and lesbian women and straight men are presumed to be similar because they share the same sexual preferences. Now, even just like reading it that way, it sounds really silly, right? Like why does sharing sexual preferences really have anything to do with everything, like your characteristics, your hobbies, your preferences, but this is actually how a lot of people understand um, uh, gay individuals. And so implicated in this theory, if this is really how people, uh, if this is really the heuristic that people are using to understand um, gay men and lesbian women, um, Im implicated is that we can understand a lot about how people perceive gay men and lesbian women by understanding how people perceive their cross-sex counterparts. So for example, if applications of gender stereotypes towards straight women impact their experiences with discrimination, and I know that these topics are talked about a lot in the WAP community, that means that these very same stereotypes might also impact gay men's experiences with discrimination and vice versa for lesbian women compared to straight men. And so work on gender inversion theory really has almost stopped at the inversion part and not necessarily has taken this next step to say, well, if this is true, if this is really what people are doing, then we should be able to draw some uh, extrapolations to other domains like prejudice and discrimination. And so luckily we know a lot about gender stereotypes, right? And so for decades, psychologists have studied the sticky nature of gender stereotypes, which presume that women are warm, kind, and friendly, while men are competitive and ambitious. And so these stereotypes about women and men that we've been studied, you know, studied in the field of psychology, sociology, you know, in many different fields, uh, are likely stereotypes actually about straight men and women specifically. And this is because there are these different biases that we have, such as heterocentrism, that, in which that we assume that, you know, things without labels, so like thinking about men, thinking about women, where we likely take, you know, the prototype of that group, and at least in America, we assume that, you know, a default person tends to be straight. So what we can do is extrapolate the, uh, what the stereotypes are for straight men and women from the work on men and women more broadly. And so thus, according to gender inversion theory, the same stereotypes associated with straight women are associated with gay men, while the same stereotypes associated with straight men are associated with lesbian women. And there's been a lot of work in this area showing that this is how people understand um, stereotypes towards these groups. 
Now, I want to point out that gender stereotypes are more than just descriptive or simply describing um, men and women's actual behaviors. They're also prescriptive, right? And so they set norms for what men and women should and should not do. And so this distinction is important because although descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes can both lead to discrimination, Prescriptive stereotypes are often uniquely associated with the backlash discrimination uh, that as people violate sort of these normative expectations placed upon them. And so if you, a lot of the work that you hear on gender stereotypes and the implications of them is really focused on the fact that, for example, women can't be agentic. Like that's a problem um, when they engage that way or if women are not warm and kind, you know, they're penalized for it. That's really about prescriptive stereotypes. And much of the work on stereotypes associated with gay men and lesbian women have only focused on descriptive stereotypes or just describing people's assumptions about their actual characteristics. And so there are no studies that I'm aware of that ask about prescriptive stereotypes or what the norms are for what gay men and lesbian women should and should not do. So for example, the work that's been done thus far has inquired about the connection between, for example, being gay and being emotional in a descriptive way, right? By asking, are gay men emotional? And maybe I can say, you know, my stereotype is gay men are emotional. That is a stereotype of gay men. However, regardless of the actual levels of emotionality in gay men, the prescriptive version of this question is, should gay men be emotional? And I would say that we actually don't know the answer to this question. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, prescriptive stereotypes play a particular role in discrimination that I think um, we really should be investigating. So in the stereotype, uh, the gender stereotype work done to date, there actually is almost an equivalence between descriptive and prescriptive expectations. So for example, not only are women descriptively stereotyped to be warm and kind, they're prescriptively supposed to be that way. So uh, when they act in ways that are counter to those expectations, that's really when they face backlash, right? And that's mirrored in stereotypes about men. So our, our, not only are men presumed to have leadership ability and they should be ambitious, uh, they're actually held to those stereotypes and they should do that. So when men um, are not ambitious, that's a problem. And so I should just note that people face backlash not only for failing to display expected traits, but for also, um, they're also penalized um, when they display traits that they shouldn't. And so these stereotypes are called proscriptive stereotypes. So the pro means like not in this case. And that includes things like being stubborn or aggressive for women or being emotional and, and weak for men. Okay, so what is not clear is whether or not there's that same level of equivalence for gay men and lesbian women, right? So is it desirable for a gay man to be emotional because men should be emotional, or excuse me, because women should be emotional and we have the same expectations of gay men as we do as straight women? Or perhaps it's undesirable for a gay man to be emotional because uh, emotionality in men is undesirable. It's unclear how all this would work. What about lesbian women? Like, are they held to the same standards as women in terms of the undesirability of being assertive? Or does their sexual orientation actually change the proscriptive nature of assertiveness in women? And so to answer this question, um, our first study sought to understand the landscape of descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes at the intersection of gender and sexual orientation. I'm actually gonna show you a, um, some work from a second study that I ran that's really focused specifically on the stereotypes and assumptions about the abilities of gay men and lesbian women in traditionally male and female domains. So I'm first gonna describe study one as well as the results of study one before outlining the design and results for study two. Okay, so let's first start, uh, talk about study one in which we're interested in like, what is the landscape of, of these types of stereotypes? And so in this study, participants reviewed a list of 70 traits, including stereotypically male, female, and neutral traits. And after participants reviewed the traits, they completed three rating tasks in which they indicated how desirable it was for a target man, woman, and person to display each of the 70 traits. And so I'm using the phrase desirable to operationalize prescriptive stereotypes. Like what is desirable? What is, you know, expected? While uh, the phrase typical is usually used to operationalize descriptive stereotypes. Um, in this uh, study, we're looking at descriptive stereotypes and actually in a more open-ended uh, way, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment. Okay, so like I said, participants um, completed three rating tasks. And so although target sex was within subjects, meaning all participants rated about a man, a woman, and a person, the sexual orientation of these targets varied between subjects. 
So some participants answered these questions with no labels, which replicate previous studies on um, gender stereotypes, while others answer desirability questions for straight targets. So a straight man, a straight woman, and a straight person, or gay targets, a gay man, a lesbian woman, and a homosexual person. And I fully recognize that the use of uh, homosexual is, a, is problematic. Um, there are other issues that I ran into with uh, different labels, so that's why um, we settled on homosexual. Okay, so after participants completed these three writing tasks, they then completed a free response task for the following four targets. And so what we asked them to do was to please take a few moments to describe a typical target or a typical straight woman, a typical straight man, a typical gay man uh, for you. So when you imagine a gay man, for example, what does he look and act like? And we reminded them that they could use a variety of descriptors, including race, age, appearance, um, you know, uh, characteristics, more, uh, et cetera. And so this is how we were interested in people's almost spontaneous descriptive beliefs about these targets uh, that we can then juxtapose with their prescriptive stereotypes uh, that we um, solicited in the rating task. So in terms of how I analyzed the data, so we analyzed the rating uh, task data using a hierarchical multi-level model in which trait, target sex, and the target sexual orientation interacted to predict those desirability ratings. And we controlled for the two-way interactions of participant gender with each of the three variables. And so we analyzed the open-ended descriptive stereotype data using like word clouds and bigram approaches. And so uh, the sample um, that we are drawing from is from the Harvard Digital Laboratory of Social Sciences, which is a online database of volunteer individuals who are willing to do surveys for the most part for free. I mean, they, they get to be entered into our raffle, but a lot of people are not necessarily motivated by the raffle. They just really like to do good science. And so it's roughly half women, but it is predominantly uh, heterosexual and white, just as a caveat to all of this work. Okay, so what do we expect? So this is the first study on prescriptive stereotypes, again, to my knowledge, uh, for gay men and lesbian women. And so I just assumed that the same equivalence between descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes that we see for straight targets, we're also going to see for gay targets which suggests that we should see gender inversion in both the descriptive, the prescriptive, and the ability stereotypes across these studies. And so thus, if gender inversion is actually shaping our understandings of gay men and lesbian women, that should mean that whatever is desirable for a straight man to do or to be, a lesbian woman should also do or be those same things, and vice versa for a gay man and a straight woman. Now, we also expected to see some evidence of that prototypicality bias that I mentioned earlier, right? The idea that all this previous work on gender stereotypes has primarily focused on men and women, but that that's actually been about straight men and women, which is why we have to explicitly ask about gay men and lesbian women. And so uh, if this is true, we should see that stereotypes in this control condition in which we don't give any label is pretty much the same thing as when we give a label and that label is straight. Okay, so I can pause here because now we're gonna move on to the results. If anyone has any questions or I can keep going, I'll ask Katie for uh, suggestions. Awesome, thanks so much, Dr. Hudson. Um, <laughs> I see, let's see, I see a hand, uh, Michelle Fackler, Fackler has Hi. her hand. And, yeah. yeah, go for it. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I, I'm really appreciating your lecture. I do have one question moving forward, um, we've been very lucky in this course and we've talked about prototypicality or stereotypicality when it comes to gender and then also race mm -hmm. um, and looking at how visual adherence to the stereotypical appearance of your gender or race kind of impacts the interpretation of your capacity or your behaviors. How does visibility of sexuality how does it make that stereotypicality different or how does it make your study unique? Um, I'm just having kind of a hard time understanding how you account for, for visibility or being able to quote unquote pass for uh, a sexuality that might not be your own. That's a, a great question. Um, so two things about that. So one, we're not showing anybody pictures of anybody. Like this is, we tell people, you know, imagine a gay man, imagine a straight woman. Um, now, you know, tell me how um, desirable is it for a gay man to display these different characteristics. Now, it is likely 
that people are bringing up a representation of this group as they answer the questions. And I don't have any control, or at least I have no insight into what that representation of that person is outside of the descriptive stereotypes. So I think the descriptive stereotypes that we're going to see um, in like the next slide might give us some sense of what people were thinking about potentially as they were answering the questions. But I, I don't know if that was, you know, I, I don't have good insight in, in, into that. Um, I will say though that by understanding how people sort of see the prototype of a group what people are, and they don't always do this, but they also tend to take, you know, someone that they're perceiving, and then they're kind of basing their reactions to them on some sort of norm that they have. And what I'm trying to do in this study is kind of understand what that norm is. And so if I see a gay man who is, um, you know, dressed um, in a way that I don't perceive as particularly flamboyant, if my understanding of a gay man is that they're a little more flamboyant, and then I'm presented with one that's not, it's really that like discrepancy between what my what my beliefs in, about this group is with what I'm presented. And so what I'm trying to do in this set of studies is just understand that first step of understanding what is the representations that people have of gay men and lesbian women, both descriptively as well as prescriptively of what they should and shouldn't be doing. And I think from there, there's the, your question to me is more about that second order step of saying, now that I'm taking those expectations, what happens when people violate them? And I, I don't know what happens when people violate them, but I think in order to get to that step, we have to first understand not only what we expect gay men and lesbian women to be, but what we expect them, what we think they should be doing or should be. Does that make sense? A absolutely. I really appreciate uh, that you separated that into two steps for me. Okay, yay. That's how I'm seeing it. Honestly, I want to get to that second step so badly. And every single time I, you know, talk about this stuff, people are like, please take a step back here. You have to first understand this step before you can go into the discrimination piece. <sighs> this is science, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. Awesome. And I see, I see that Chu has their hand raised. Chu, I'm unmuting you now. Hi, Dr. Hudson. Um, thank you so much for joining us and really excited to hear the findings. Um, I think what I really appreciate is you making the distinguish, um, distinguishment between gender and sexual orientation, because I know oftentimes for folks, like that's even just the first step understanding the difference. So my question is more about when you spoke to the LGB section, um, can you speak a little bit about the challenges of um, your research or other related research and understanding the B, because my understanding is in academic literature, oftentimes bisexual people are marginalized in society, even from the lesbian and the gays, in addition to the heterosexual people. So I'm curious to know in your research and as we get into the descriptive stereotypes, what are some of the challenges in measuring bisexuality? Oh, that's a that's a, a beautifully great question. So I have I have not directly measured any of these stereotypes towards bisexual individuals, and I really want to, um, for the reasons that you outlined just now. That our understandings of bisexual individuals are complicated. We either do some sort of um, I, I have a word for the racial version of this, where you are reduced down to the low status group. Um, um, so that's a hypo descent in the racial context. I don't have like a equivalent word in the sexual orientation context, but I think that that's kind of what happens with bisexual individuals. Like a bisexual man is just gay. Like that is how a lot of people perceive them. But then the question is, well, they're not gay. And so what does all of that mean for how people perceive them and then the discrimination that they face? I don't have an answer to that, but I know that it is tricky to study bisexual individuals, in part because a lot of people don't even believe that bisexual individuals exist. It's like, no, you don't, there isn't a such thing as bisexuality. It's just, you're a, a closeted gay person. Like that's, that's you know, the, the reduction that happens. And so if you take that, well, then potentially what you can derive um, from my work is maybe the stereotypes that we have of uh, lesbian women and gay men might be applied to their bisexual counterparts, but they might also have another level of negativity because people don't even see that they exist. 
but that's an empirical question and i think that a question that should be studied um and i haven't gotten there yet when i was actually designing this study i had bisexual individuals and people were like kira you're already at a seven by three by a 70 by three by three please don't do this to yourself please you know <laughs> you know make it simpler but i think what this research really shows for me is that there is such a lack of nuance in the work that is going on to date. And you don't even see it until you start just to add a little bit, right? So one of the critiques I get sometimes is, well, you're talking about uh, lesbian women, but there's different types. Like a lesbian woman could be a little more masculine presenting. She could be a little more feminine presenting. So, you know, you're kind of glossing over that. Um, and my answer to that is I am glossing over uh, over that, but also note that we're perfectly fine just talking about women as a broad category. We're perfectly fine being on this broad category. As soon as I add more nuance, I think it just highlights for people just how much more nuance is needed in this work. So I am not, I don't even think I'm at the level of nuance that I actually really need to be. I'm trying to get there and I'm trying to get there systematically. So wait a few years <laughs> and then maybe I'll be able to answer a better question. <laughs> So I can move on. So I'll move on to some of the descriptive stuff and thank you. Um, okay. And then we'll again, pause again for questions because I, I love all these questions. Okay, so what do we find for descriptive stereotypes? Remember for descriptive stereotypes, we looked at, uh, we had people do open-ended responses. It's like, tell me what you think a typical gay man, straight man um, is. And so what I'm going to do is to give you just a taste of what participants wrote. So here's just a sample paragraph for each of the targets. Um, you can definitely say that I like cherry pick these. Um, and in some ways I did. I thought that these were just uh, really interesting paragraphs. But I'm going to show you some things that like aggregate the data as a whole. That's not me cherry picking. So in the case for a straight man, one person wrote that a straight man is a 50 to 6 year old white man, essentially a stereotypical politician, smart, business savvy, cunning, somewhat manipulative, and makes a lot of money. That was this person's typical representation of a straight person. In contrast to a gay man, oh, excuse me, a straight man. In contrast, a gay man is someone who's 20 to 40 years old, dresses in a lot of tight V-neck t-shirts and skinny jeans, flirtatious white middle to lower class, uses drugs, promiscuous, strong personality, upbeat and flamboyant. That is a, a, a gay man. Now let's talk about a straight woman. This is probably my favorite one. Um, so a straight woman is 20 to 40, uh, wears dresses once in a while, but also wears pants. She's smart, but not too smart. She's flirtatious and sexy, but not too promiscuous. Has children and cares about the family, but she's not the main breadwinner, not assertive or athletic. That's one person's representation of a straight woman. In contrast, a lesbian woman, uh, she looks butch, she has short hair, wears pants all the time and leather, long sleeve shirts, kind of dresses like a lumberjack, assertive, competitive, and maybe well off economically, but not rich, 30 to 40 years old. So I also think it's very interesting about how the, like there's a lot of age interesting dynamics, which um, trying to understand that is, has, is our, our next step in some of this. Um, so what I'm gonna do, so imagine like participants answered, wrote these kind of paragraphs and the average paragraph was about 27 words. And just to give you a sense of that, the first paragraph is about 30 something words. So like there's a lot that you can pack into, you know, 27 words. So what we did was put this all into like a big bucket, everyone's responses. Then we, you know, picked out the common words like and, the, a, picked out all of those. And then now what we're going to do is put them in a word cloud. And word clouds um, are going to show you the proportion of the words that were generated in these two categories. And so the size of the word is proportional to the frequency with which the word occurred in the text, but the words are not comparable across word clouds, just as an FYI. So now let's look at the word cloud for lesbian women. And the thing that sort of just like jumps out to me is that lesbian women are masculine. And then the next word is like, you have hair and you have short, which likely was short hair put together. Um, but there's like, you know, those are like the big things that really pop out as people are generating, you know, these, these descriptive, um, these descriptive, what am I trying to say? Uh, these descriptive descriptions, that's why I didn't want to say that, that sounds really stupid, but that, that's what it is, these descriptive descriptions of, um, uh, of lesbian women. And also see some other things, like there seems to be a lot of words relating to their appearance. You see a, literally appearance, wearing jeans, you know, there's a lot of uh, words there. You have 
butch is a word, um, something about how they're dressing. There's a lot of words around uh, dressing. Um, and, you know, I would say that this is at least some evidence that when people are thinking of lesbian women, they are thinking more masculine. In contrast for gay men, the biggest word that you see is well, and that doesn't really tell you much, but it's really because it was well-dressed kind of put together. And you can even see, see if my cursor shows up, yay. Well-dressed, someone did not, I guess, put a space between that. Um, so well-dressed is, again, something that comes out. But appearance, again, is really what seems to be driving people's descriptive stereotypes of, of these folks. You have appearance also in a big word. You have that they're a little more flamboyant. But you're also getting now some actual stereotypes of gay men that they are sensitive, they're emotional, they're effeminate. And that uh, also seems to be in line with like gender inversion, right? People are ascribing stereotypes that we traditionally associate with straight women onto gay men. Okay. Now, word clouds examine words as individual units. However, as we can see with the word like well, um, which really was probably attached to well-dressed or short, which was probably attached to short hair, um, we really, uh, there's many interesting text analyses that's actually based on the relationship between the words, whether examining which words either tend to follow others immediately or words that tend to co-occur. And so bigrams allows us to see more of the context in which each particular word was generated. So I'm going to show you the bigrams for lesbian women. So here's the bigrams for lesbian women. So these are showing the words that were like co-occurring right next to each other. And you can actually see the arrow that uh, dictates the direction uh, of, of the word. So you can see here that uh, for lesbian women, uh, they, I guess they're flannel shirts. You have, they wear pants. Um, there also is this like nice cluster of concepts that really seem to be tied together as people are describing a lesbian woman. And in particular, there's a lot around hair. There is some stuff around their age and their class. There's some stuff about their race that they tend to wear masculine clothing. Um, and so that seems to be like a cluster of how people are understanding lesbian women. Just to uh, point it out that there were people who specifically said, you know what, there are some lesbian women that aren't like this at all. Uh, they're lipstick lesbians. And that was actually the phrase that kind of came up um, more frequently than, uh, you know, it wasn't just feminine lesbians, it was specifically lipstick lesbians. And then the final thing I'm going to point out is that there is this cluster of, you see, like age, race, nationality, uh, socioeconomic status. Those are people who are saying lesbian women could be any of these things. They could be any age, any race, any nationality, any socioeconomic status. And so there were people who did say that. But as you can tell from the, the other sort of clusters in these bigrams, that wasn't everybody. And people did have like, well, if I had to guess their race, their race would be white. If I had to guess, um, you know, they would be in their mid 20s. And so there, there was um, some descriptive things that came out, even though people were saying that they could be kind of anybody. Okay, so that's the bigrams for lesbian women. And now we can go to the bigrams for gay men. And so here you see a similar cluster of like that kind of typical gay man. Um, but even then it's not nearly as robust, interestingly, as it was for the lesbian women. And so you have like a typical gay male, you know, is white, uh, middle to upper class. So you also see that gay men tend to have slightly higher socioeconomic statuses. And that's also what you see when you actually look through the paragraphs. Um, they are slightly effeminate. They are uh, sensitive and emotional. Uh, again, they are uh, some more physical, more appearances, so they're physically fit. They tend to be slightly older. They wear skinny jeans. We saw that in the word clouds, but now there's just a little more context around it. Um, and then you get this, you know, that cluster of age, race, nationality. That's really people saying they could be any age, any race, any nationality. But interestingly, socioeconomic status for gay men actually seems to be a little bit separate. Meaning that on average, people actually saw gay men to have almost slightly higher status. Their associations of gay men uh, was a little more, that they were a little uh, more well off than lesbian women. Now, this is just honestly the tip of the iceberg that you can do with this kind of data. We are interested in doing um, like sentiment analyses where we really start to understand the positivity, the negativity of these words so that we can more directly compare what are the words that are related to appearance? What are the words that are related to um, like family, for example? So we, we are having RAs um, do some hard coding of this data as well as do more like bottom up text mining approaches um, to really understand descriptive stereotypes. However, I would say on the whole, these stereotypes to me do show evidence of gender inversion that on average people see gay men a little more femininely and uh, lesbian women a little more masculinely.
And so I believe I can also stop there for questions if anyone has them. Awesome, thanks so much. I see, Nat, you have your hand raised. I'm unmuting you now. Oh, sorry. Hello? There you are. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, thank you very much. Uh, it is very interesting. And I have a question regarding the uh, brains in the, um, the biogram and the word clouds, because um, I wonder how much of it is that um, because the, they are white, they already have that privilege. And so like for people who are like minorities or like uh, it's, it's, they already have the barrier, like they don't want to add another layer. Um, and so like there are less of like out there, maybe there are like there are same, in terms of like population, maybe the same, but the people who are out there and say like out of the closet and say, I'm gay, I'm lesbian, like there are they, certain people that have that ability to do that and other people don't. And so I don't know if you have like done research or like other research that's show, talking about the intersection of that and how people come out of the closet. So I don't have research on how people come out of the closet. However, I think what you're pointing out is there's a, almost a prototype of a gay person that tends yeah. to be white and it could be white because um, those are also the people who might have a little bit more privilege to be able to uh, have that I identity in, 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 in a uh, prouder way. And that's super fair. Um, I actually think that there's, uh, if I remember correctly, there are either equal numbers of ethnic minorities who also identify as queer more broadly or actually slightly higher numbers uh, in um, racial minorities, but the people that tend to be seen tend to be white. Um, and I definitely think that part of that could also be that um, gay men, and also it's there's a gendered component, right? So when you think of a gay person, you tend to also think man. And I think that that's also just part of these prototypicality biases that we have. So the default person is a man. The default person, at least in America, is presumed to be white. So for example, if you were to Google a firefighter, almost all those firefighters would be white. If you Google a black firefighter, you're more likely to get black and white photos of a white firefighter than you are to get an actual African-American firefighter. Do some of these Google searches. It's actually really fascinating. Um, but I think all of that sort of comes into play. And it's, to me, what's fascinating is that people are actually willing to report that. They're willing to say, hey, honestly, gay people tend to be white. Like, that is my stereotypical, you know, gay person. I do think that there was, I don't have the biograms for straight men and straight women. I don't know if white comes up more often there. And that would also be an interesting um, like comparison to make, which is why I'm saying there's a lot more work that we, we can do with this open-ended data. But it'd be really fascinating to see whether or not the representations of being white actually shows up more for gay men and lesbian women, partly because of the, some of the dynamics that you're, that you're mentioning. Um, so I guess my short answer should have been, that's a great question, I don't know, but it's all you know, important to think about. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Another question? Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up, so go I'm for it. Going. Okay, so now we're gonna talk, move into the rating task data and look at the prescriptive stereotypes that people have. And one thing that I mentioned earlier was that a lot of the work on gender stereotypes really focus on men and women with no labels. And I'm saying those are the same stereotypes as straight men and women, they didn't need to put the labels because we presume that the default person is straight. Now, I actually can test that empirically, right? And I can test that empirically because if uh, people's default representations of folks are that they're straight, I can look at the desirability ratings and show that they're more similar between the straight and control condition as compared to the gay and control condition. Now, I'm going to give you just an intuitive sense of heterocentrism uh, in the following graph. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the desirability ratings for all 70 traits at the intersection of the target and sexual orientation. So you'll see like for all the person um, targets, you'll, you'll see every single one of the traits in terms of people's desirability to, of that person to have the trait. Uh, and the color is gonna indicate the condition. So the control condition is the condition with no labels. So that's the, uh, the black dots. The straight condition will be in blue and the gay condition will be in pink. 
So if heterocentrism guides people's prescriptive stereotypes, what we should see is a very tight correspondence between the black dots and the blue dots, because that's the condition with no labels, and that's the condition um, when we added the label, but we added in the label straight. So, and that's exactly what you see. I don't think I'll ever have a graph as beautiful as this one, in which you can see for every single sex, like we're talking about people, we're talking about a man, we're talking about a woman, that people have, or people report the same level of desirability for a, um, for a man as they do a straight man, for a woman as they do a straight woman, and for a person as they do a straight person. And importantly, this is between subjects, right? These are not the same participants answering for no labels versus labels, which kind of makes this finding even more fascinating. And you can see that this almost works for every single trait, all 70 traits. Now let me show you um, the uh, sexual orientation, right? So let me let me add in desirability for gay targets. And you can see that the desirability for gay targets are, is wildly different regardless of the, the sex, right? And so this finding is also borne out statistically um, as well as if you do the pairwise comparison. So on the individual trait level, there's only a single trait for which control targets differed from straight targets, but there were 63 traits for which gay targets differed from control targets. Again, suggesting that like the work that we've seen now on gender prescriptive stereotypes, we might be able to apply that to prescriptive stereotypes for straight people, but we definitely can't apply it to gay people, which is why you know this work I think is, is important. Okay, so now we're actually gonna move on to assess whether or not there's evidence of gender inversion in the actual prescriptive stereotypes for gay men and lesbian women. Now, what I'm going to do is I looked at all 70 traits and what I did was actually categorize these traits into one of three interactional patterns because trying to show you 70 traits would be way too overwhelming and I'm not gonna do that to you. So what I'm gonna do is show you a series of graphs that look like this one. And so target sex will be on the X axis and the sexual orientation of the target is gonna be indicated by the colors that we just saw in the previous graph. There will always be a line uh, that is the midpoint of this. This was a one line scale, so the midpoint is five. And that means that the desirability of the, if the desirable of the trait is above the mid, that means that that is a prescriptive trait. People, people should do that trait. If it's below the line, that means it's a proscribed trait, meaning people should not do it. And what we did was use Bonferroni corrected um, uh, for, we, we corrected for pairwise comparisons using Bonferroni within traits. So there's actually 36 different comparisons you can do uh, within trait when you have a uh, gay, straight, and control by man, woman, person. There's actually 36 that you can do. We weren't interested in all 36, but we controlled at the level of 36 because we're doing so many different comparisons that we were trying to, we had a tight uh, tension between type one error and type two error. This is our way of trying to control for type one error while still actually pulling out meaningful um, patterns. Now, we did this um, method of actually categorizing things into different interactional patterns instead of doing a factor analysis, because when you do a factor analysis, given that these traits are kind of going in different directions based on the target, you end up with uh, factors that aren't meaningful. You end up with a factor of everything that people should do, everything that people shouldn't do, and like well-dressed, which is not particularly meaningful for what we're trying to actually do. And also part of the impetus of this project was to give a landscape of stereotypes, right? So that we can understand, hey, this, you know, if we're looking at emotionality, if we're looking at assertiveness, if we're looking at ambitious, how do these things or how do these traits um, get differentially prescribed or proscribed to different targets? So that's also why we wanted to keep it on the trait level, but still do some version of data reduction. Okay. So let's look at gender inversion, right? So statistically, I define gender inversion to mean that there was significant gender differences for both uh, the gay condition as well as the straight condition, meaning there had to be differences between uh, genders, but that the difference had to be in the opposite direction. And so what you can clearly see here for uh, being assertive, that it is more desirable for a straight man to be assertive compared to a straight woman, but it's actually less desirable for a gay man to be assertive compared to a lesbian woman. You can, you can see that flip in the, the gendered um, expectations. And that was true. So we found evidence for gender inversion for seven of the traits. 
traits like aggressive, approval seeking, compassionate, controlling, forceful, and sensitive. And so this is not complete gender inversion as lesbian women show lowered, like people don't prefer or people don't desire for a lesbian woman to have the same level of assertiveness as they do for a straight man. And the only trait that showed complete gender inversion happened to be approval seeking, where you can see almost that, like that perfect, where's my um, cursor, that almost perfect X between like what people desired the men and women of different sexual orientations to do. Okay. Moving on, there was an additional eight traits that showed a pattern of gender asymmetry. And this pattern is interesting because that means that the desirability ratings for either the man or the woman target was the same for all sexual orientations, but diverged uh, for the opposite gender. And so technically this is still gender inversion. We're still seeing the fact that like, uh, there are a significant gender differences for, for both the gay targets and the straight targets. But what makes this pattern a little more interesting is that the normative pressure is on one gender. So if we look at um, the desirability to pay attention to people's appearances, interestingly, there's no difference in the desirability to pay attention to their appearance for either gay men or straight men. However, there are clear differences for women. So it is much more desirable for a straight woman to pay attention to her appearance than a lesbian woman. And so uh, we see this like gender asymmetry in which the normative pressure is on the woman for five traits, while excitability expresses emotion and theatrical were the three traits in which the pressure is on the man and not the woman. So here you can see there's no difference in the desirability of women of either sexual orientation to be theatrical, but there is much more pressure for a gay man to be theatrical than a straight man. And so if you take uh, these two versions of gender inversion together, 15 of our traits showed gender inversion in some form. However, the bulk of the traits did not show uh, any evidence of gender inversion. Instead, these traits showed a pattern of sexual orientation asymmetry, such that there was significant gender differences for one sexual orientation and not the other. And that was pretty much just for straight targets. So in other words, there were gender differences amongst the straight targets, but not amongst the gay targets. And that was true for 37 other traits. So for example, in the case of business sense, you can see that straight men uh, it's more desirable for a straight man to have business sense compared to a straight woman. There's actually no difference in how much business sense is desired um, in gay men compared to lesbian women. And so this actually represents, like I said, the bulk of the traits. And so to me, what this implies is that although gay men might be perceived like straight women and lesbian women might be perceived like straight men in some cases, gender might not matter as much as sexual orientation in terms of how we view these targets. So we can also look at a trait that's uh, proscribed, right? So again, you can see that it is much less desirable for a straight man to be weak compared to a straight woman, but there's actually no difference in, in the desirability of either a gay man or a lesbian woman to be weak. And so there's actually two additional points I want to mention before we end. So one, I find it interesting uh, that although it's more desirable for lesbians to be assertive, aggressive, and forceful than straight women, there are no differences in, in the desirability for traits like business sense, being career oriented, or things like leadership ability, right? So this suggests that although it might be acceptable for lesbian women to display dominance from a personality point of view, it might not be acceptable for them to display dominance in a way that might disturb the gender status quo, right? So in some ways this complicates our understandings of dominance because what it does is splits it up into maybe uh, agency, it splits up dominance into like uh, agency and competence. And actually some work by Ashley Rosette in the context of race has shown a similar split so what she finds in her work is that Black women are allowed to be dominant or are uh, assumed to be dominant from like an agentic point of view, but not from a competent point of view, whereas Asian women are assumed to be dominant from a competent point of view, but not from an agency point of view, whereas white women are actually not ascribed either kind of competencies. And so the second thing I want to point out is that, as you might have noticed from the graphs, for many of the traits, the differences between straight and gay men are much larger than the differences between straight and lesbian women. And so for me, this suggests that by being gay, gay men actually lose status afforded to men, uh, while lesbian women don't really gain much status for being a lesbian. And so I am drawing a conclusion that 
when we think about why women are prescribed, the traits that they're prescribed, they're prescribed that way because they're seen as lower in status. And when we think about uh, how men lose status, they lose status by being like women, the fact that uh, for really for the bulk of the traits, gay men and lesbian women are like women, to me suggests that it's really about status. Like there's something about status that's really um, impacting our expectations of prescriptive men and women. And so the idea that to be gay is to be low status, to me is also borne out in traits that don't show any gender differences at all. And so instead what you can see is just main effects of sexual orientation, such that it's actually less desirable for gay men and le lesbian women to be loyal or dependent or honest, traits that I would say are good for anyone to display. Now, of course, this everyone's traits are above the line, right? So everyone should be honest, but gay men and lesbian women are just not held to the same standards about being honest, um, which I would say is a good thing uh, as much as straight men and straight women. And so the only traits for which the desirability was higher for gay targets was for the more negative ones, things like being moody, being nosy, or being superstitious. And so I am going to pause there to one, uh, take questions, and also to see how well we're doing on time because I don't have to present this next baby study. It's a really small study. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. I see that Joanna Everett has her hand raised. Uh, I've unmuted you, Joanna. You can go right ahead. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, so my work has looked at uh, stereotyping of politicians and the impact that these stereotypes have on straight versus uh, gay and lesbian politicians. And one of the things I have found uh, has been that um, the, the gender of the respondent uh, plays a big role, such that male respondents are the ones who are more likely to have more negative uh, uh, stereotypes about gay men, more positive stereotypes about gay women or lesbian women, and vice versa. You know, women, uh, women tend to be more uh, positive towards gay men and the stereotypes that they hold and, and less positive perhaps to, to uh, lesbian women. And I was just wondering if you had looked at the, the gender of the respondents and participants in your study. That's a great question. So uh, I have two thoughts. One is we, uh, we controlled for gender. So I actually interacted gender with each of the different variables to sort of pull out the variance that was associated with gender. So um, but when you actually look at those interactions, and some of them are significant, what you actually see is that women are more stereotypical than men. So in terms of reporting what women, so I should also say that this is supposed to be all on the American level. Like we, for this um, set of data, we weren't interested in participants' actual beliefs. We asked them to say like, what do you think uh, you know, an average American, like in general, people would respond, not your own opinions, but people as a whole. And women assume that people are much more stereotypical than men do. And part of that, I mean, I think there's a, several reasons why that could happen. And in some ways, that's like opposite your finding, but I don't think it's opposite because we're also asking different things. We're asking about society as a whole versus your own individual uh, attitudes. And I definitely think that women, potentially as they experience sexism, know that people are stereotypical, that these stereotypes exist. And so they might just be more likely to say, yeah, no, that stereotype that, you know, about a gay man, it's much more likely to uh, be high compared to a man. So, but in terms of like formally doing, I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily interested in gender differences, but I just wanted to control for them. Um, but it would be fascinating to really like dive deep and to understand the gender differences and whether or not there are gender differences in like the specific traits that show gender inversion, the traits that like don't show any gender differences, like maybe women assume that there's gender differences, but men don't. All of that could be definitely very interesting to um, like dive into. And so at some point I'm working on it, I'm going to put essentially all this data up on OSF so that people can play and have all the fun that they want to um, with this data set. So I'll, I'll, I can let you know when, once that happens. Awesome, and then I see we have three questions up. I see Jessica Clark, then Jessica Halem, then Antita. Jessica Clark, I'm on. Ah, great, you're good to go. Um, Hi, I'm a law professor, and um, this is just so uh, fascinating and amazing. 
And I was wondering if you had considered some of the legal implications of this work for people who are trying to win discrimination cases. Um, sexual orientation is not covered by federal anti-discrimination law, but sex discrimination is. And the Supreme Court is probably going to say in the next couple weeks that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is not a type of sex discrimination. And so lesbian and gay plaintiffs can't win discrimination cases in federal court unless they can prove that the discrimination against them was based on a sex stereotype. And so I'm wondering if your data could help a lesbian, for example, demonstrate that she was discriminated against in a way a gay man wouldn't have been. Mm, so it's, so actually, as you were talking about the legal implications, I don't even know if I want to put this on record, but I would say that m the results almost suggest no, that yeah. beca because it doesn't really seem that people are really picking out gay men and lesbian women differently in terms of what, at least in terms of what we desire them to be. Now, my assumption, as I've kind of alluded to, is that it's about status, that we see gay people as low status, and that's actually where we want them to be. And because it's where we want them to be, like, that is how, um, you know, that's why you don't see any differences for the bulk of the traits between gay men and lesbian women. However, when it comes to discrimination, it's not enough just to know about where we want them to be. It's also just as important to understand where they are, right? And so here's where you do have to marry the descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes. And when you do that, I would say you almost get into like a, an odd space in some ways where for straight targets, descriptive and prescriptive stereotypes seem to be the same thing. That doesn't seem to necessarily be the case for gay men and lesbian women. And so, for example, for lesbian women, descriptively, she's like supposed to be assertive. Like that's our understanding of lesbian women, that they're this assertive figure. And maybe that works for assertiveness, um, but also maybe we assume that she's career oriented. However, at least what this data suggests is that we don't actually want lesbian women to be career oriented. That's actually something that we don't actually desire of them when we desire them to have the same level of career orientation as a straight woman. And so what that suggests is like that discrimination against them could be because of their gender, but it also seems to be like this particular interesting interplay between what we think that they are versus where we want them to be. So that next, before I would say there are any legal implications, I would want to do that next step, like to do that step to say, hey, what it actually seems like, and this is my belief about what would happen with lesbian women, is that they're not penalized interpersonally for being uh, counter normative for their gender. It's perfectly fine for lesbian women to be, you know, a little more masculine in her personality. What it's not okay is for her to be that way from like a career point of view. And so in the same way that a man being a man, like, you know, being angry, being, you know, macho, whatever, gives them a boost in their salary, gives them a boost in their, um, their perceived status. I don't think you're going to get a boost at all for lesbian women. They might not get penalized though. And, but then you get this like odd discrepancy where people are like, yeah, you're super great, but there's no connection between people's you know, perceptions of her and her actual objective outcomes on the job, which is a form potentially of discrimination too. So I, I would hesitate to really say that you know, this, these data directly have implications. I think it's a lot of studies that need to be run. But what I will say is the implications of some of this does to me matter for these kind of discrimination cases. And so one um, piece that I didn't necessarily show is that if you look at, for example, the desirability of a woman to be warm and kind, everyone should be warm and kind. Women are held, uh, straight women are held to a higher standard. Um, but lesbian women are not held to the same standard as a straight woman in terms of being warm and kind. And so thinking like, will a lesbian woman get penalized if she's not warm and kind to her subordinates? I don't know. Um, but then to me, what this, this begs the question of what is actually then driving stereotypes or not stereotypes, what is actually driving discrimination towards um, gay men and lesbian women if it's not our expectations of them? I don't know. So it's there's a lot of open questions. This is all like, first step and notice like all the things that we're talking about and we're generating to me like this was the purpose of this study to like generate like new research ideas 
new ways that we can think about theories. How does this implicate like role congruity theory? I think all those things are like important to, to think about. Hopefully I sort of answered your question. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm going to, let's see, where's Jessica, here she is. All right, Jessica Halem, I see you have a question. I'm unmuting you now. I'll keep it real short because you did touch a little bit on what I was going to ask. Hi, Jessica Hallam over here at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hudson, wonderful to uh, meet you. Uh, I, I am a professional lesbian who I think is benefiting from a lot of what you're describing. I'm fascinated, and you touched on this, that you're going to put the data up because I would love to just even look at the tiny little differences between straight women and lesbians in your data because I, I just, I would love to see, even though it doesn't look like it's probably that uh, significant of the questions you were asking, I would love to start to parse out what I think you're getting at, which is gender expression among women, right? So I work in LGBTQ uh, uh, medicine. I, I do a lot of transgender work and a lot of work around gender. And so I think what you're getting at, which is what we really needed to do if we were going to truly extrapolate sexual orientation from gender identity, but what it then allows us is to look at this category of woman uh, as a more, as a, as a complicated, complicating the category of woman and really starting to get at gender expression among the category of woman um, which I am really hot to look at because I think that is fascinating. And um, so I'd be curious, did you extrapolate anything a little bit among straight women and lesbians that, that you could share or do we need to still do that work? So we definitely still need to do that work because here, this is not about gender expression. Like people didn't see any examples. They weren't reacting. All I have is what they might've been thinking in their minds. They might have been thinking about more um, masculine presenting lesbians. I don't know. They're likely were thinking about uh, feminine presenting uh, straight women. I'm running a study in which I actually tried to manipulate that gender presentation from sexual orientation. So I, I actually found, this is funny, I found a, a lesbian couple that was either, one was dressed a little more masculinely and one was dressed more femininely, but they were like cute and matched in green. So I actually cropped their faces, separated them, and then said they either could have been straight or gay. And so there I was trying to see like, okay, well, if you're straight, but you, if you're a straight woman, but a little more masculine presenting, versus feminine presenting, like how are you penalized and whatnot. And people really did not like a masculine presenting straight woman at all. Um, but for a masculine, for lesbian women, there really didn't seem to be any preferences for how they were presenting. It was like, well, you lesbian? Okay. Like, it, and so there, there didn't seem to be much difference. Now that all needs to be like re-replicated. There are, you know, variety of issues. Like most people, because of our tight course, like our tight assumptions about people's gender presentation and their sexual orientation. When I then asked people as a, as a manipulation check, what was the person's gender? What was the person's sexual orientation? Uh, people were messing up in the ways that you would expect. So I, in some ways, like I had like really uneven cell sizes because people were just like, yeah, that masculine woman was gay, right? No, she wasn't gay. Or people were like, she was a man. She wasn't a man. And so it's just, I, I, think that there's a lot more work that needs to happen um, as relates to presentation. And it's just as important to also then add on, because you said that you, you work with transgender individuals. That's like, the, that's like another layer, right? Like how does gender presentation also then work when you are then read as transgender? Like all, all of these things are, yeah, there's not nearly as much work in psychology. If you take, what is it? The gender, gender, gingerbread man, like actually saying that these things are not in line psychology is not caught up with that. Um, and so this is, again, my first step. There's so many more steps. We are not up no mountain. We, you know, we just saw the mountain. We're like, whoo, the mountain is there. We got to climb that. <laughs> so, yay. Awesome. Thanks so much. Montita, I am unmuting you now so you can ask your question. Hi, uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hudson. Um, so you touched on this a little bit about how the study is asking um, what's desirable, not 
for people as a personal belief, but for what people think in general society would find desirable. And this is a bit speculative, but I was just wondering if you think you had rerun this study asking specifically personal belief um, rather than uh, what people assume society holds to be true. What sorts of differences, if you've thought about this, um, do you suppose you would have found? And then if you think there would be a difference or if you don't think there would be a difference, what that would mean for how we understand these forms of stereotyping and discrimination structurally? Um, yeah. Yes, that's a great question. I honestly don't think that people would want to stereotype at all if I asked about their personal beliefs. Um, I do think that people would have been much more comfortable stereotyping for maybe men and women because we kind of are okay with gender. Like gender is one of those things where you talk about like sexist jokes and people laugh. You talk about racist jokes, you're like, ooh, ah. You, you know, like we understand uh, sometimes I think the importance of combating racism much more than we think about combating sexism. And I think it's because sexism is so normative. Like sexism pervades so much of, I think, our our lives. Like the fact that, you know, we line up girls and boys left and right. If we were to say all the white kids line up and all the black kids lined up, there would be a lawsuit, like a legit lawsuit. We don't have that for, for gender. And so I, I think by asking for people to give me their their societal expectations might have freed themselves to say what they themselves think. Because at the end of the day, if you know what society believes, <laughs> that likely is in line with what you believe. Not always, but I mean, that's how we understand society, right? Um, I think that if I were to take, I think that the, the descriptive stereotypes sort of point out uh, that because so many people were like, they could be any race, they could be any gender. Like, you know, why are you making me do this? Because I asked, for their specific beliefs. Um, now, if I would have said, you know, how do you think the average American understands a, a gay person? I actually think that people would have been even more stereotypical than what than what we got. So I, I do think that um, asking about people's direct beliefs, especially when it relates to marginalized groups is just a, a hard thing to do because no one wants to admit like, yeah, I hold stereotypes. Because they think by holding them, that must mean that they apply them. They kind of do that like second order, you are, you know, asking me this because you're trying to find out if I'm homophobic. And it's like, I really wasn't. But um, I, I can say that all day and tomorrow. They don't, they don't have to believe me. Um, and so I do think that the results would have been different, but I think the results would have been just people wouldn't want to say anything. People would have been like fives all the way. Midpoint, we got nothing. I don't know. Awesome, thanks. And Sophie, I saw your hand up a while ago. I see it's back up. You got a question? I have a question. Um, thank you so much. Hi. Um, my question is, is sort of about methodology and about the mountain that you talked about. Um, so we've had amazing speakers all year who've covered different um, sort of different facets of identity and diversity. Um, and I've noticed that Several have mentioned that for the purposes of the study, they've utilized the gender binary because they're two convenient categories. Um, and I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done around this so that we can have sort of the psychological data to underpin lived experiences of folks who fall somewhere on the spectrum, reject the spectrum, are trans or gender queer. How, like if you're being imaginative and creative, how might you create or suggest a study set up so that we can look at gender not as not as a binary category, especially like as you've said, most of us are socialized to believe that it is a binary and not to question it. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so there's, if I had to, you know, off the cuff, let me be imaginative. So one way that we can try to get people to think about gender more at, on the binary uh, in this kind of framework would be potentially some priming studies. So they've shown that um, you can flash people with faces of men and faces of women uh, that can vary in how st stereotypical the faces are as it relates to their gender. Um, so you can actually move people's norms about what a typical feminine face is to be a little more masculine and to be a little more feminine. What would be fascinating is to do that several times you know, to, to sort of move people along this spectrum and then have them answer these rating questions, right? So if I'm like having people to think about women, but I just kind of move their typical representation of what a woman looks like to be a little more masculine, 
is that reflected in their um, stereotypes? That's like one off the cuff way. Another way would be to use labels, right? We can say, you can present the exact same person uh, and say, this person identifies as non-binary. What do you expect this person to do, be, or say? The hard part I am finding, even in, this own, in, in my own work, is to separate out people not having any expectations. Like, they're like, I got no idea. Like, I could not predict what this person would do from I don't want to tell you, like I have assumptions, but I don't want to tell you, or the more positive spin of that is they don't have to do nothing. Like they could be who they want to be. They're free from societal expectations, which is actually something that a lot of people see queer individuals to be. It's like by you being queer, you're actually rejecting the very thing that we're trying to study. And if I'm at, in, at, at all sensitive to that, I might say, hey, you know, there's no, I have no expectations of them. Those are like, those three motivations would end up the same response. Trying to pick that apart to me is also like an interesting like layer to a, a lot of this. Um, and then it's also the question of, well, to what extent do you see gender as essential? And so that could be a, an individual difference that I could have measured even with this study. And it could be that, you know, the more that you see gender as an essential category, the maybe even the more stereotypical you are towards gay individuals. Like you see that, you know, no, gay men need to be just like uh, straight women and lesbian women need to be just like straight men because this like gender is so important. Now that you like the same, I don't know, gender as somebody else, like that's how you get, that's how you get gender inversion. So that is just me spitballing. It's definitely something that's been, that's been on my mind. I feel, I, I get very frustrated at the lack of tools to study these things along the spectrum. And you're right, a, a lot of us have cop-outs where we're like, for the sake of convenience, we did it this way. And this is how science becomes so siloed. This is why we have subjects that are all from America and are all for, from you know college samples. They're, they're weird. That's how you get it. Um, you have, that's how you end up that way. And for scholars who even try to think about it, it's really hard. Like this study was hard to do. The data analysis alone like broke my computer. My computer literally told me the word sorry. They're like, sorry, we don't have enough memory for this. And I was like, okay, what am I supposed to do with that? Um, and so thinking of how difficult it is, I could see why a lot of people are turned off by it. But to me, it just shows just how important it is. So I guess I don't actually have an answer as much as to say, I'm with you. There needs to be more work along the spectrum. Um, and I'm sorry that I, I'm just like those other people. You're great. Thank you so much. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. And when the next does it end? Uh, at one o'clock. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we we do not have to get to this last study. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm just gonna put up the last slide just because not the last slide. I'm just gonna tell you what I did. That to me is the most interesting piece. Um, okay. The most interesting part of this study, in my opinion, is this result. So what I did was just ask people, um, who do you think would be more successful as a mathematician, an English teacher, or a business executive? And what they had to do was to do the forced choice. So who do you think would be more successful, a, a, a gay man or a straight woman, a straight woman or a lesbian woman, a lesbian woman or a straight man, right? They had to do all those forced comparisons. Um, and they did this for a mathematician, an English teacher, and a business executive. Now, what I expected was some evidence of gender inversion, right? That for a mathematician, that's a little more of a masculine job. So people might think that the straight man is, you know, the best mathematician or be the most successful as a mathematician, but the next one would be a lesbian woman. Who? That's not what we found. Instead, what we find, so all of these things use straight men as a comparison, which is why straight men are always uh, at zero or at baseline. Um, these are log odds, but don't worry about that. You can really just see, you know, take this as like a ranking who people thought would be the most successful, the next successful, vice versa. What you can see here is that for a mathematician and business executive, people thought that the straight man would be the most successful, followed by the straight woman in both mathematician and business executive cases. People did not make any differences between how successful they thought a gay man or a lesbian woman would be as a mathematician and a business executive. They were always chosen, they were always chosen the least you get the reverse pattern for an English teacher. 
actually the best English teacher, the English teacher who would be most successful is a straight woman, then followed by a straight man. They uh, did have at least this, this difference is significant that, that they thought that a lesbian woman would be the next most successful, but this is not gender inversion. I mean, gay men is would are assumed to be like the least successful as an English teacher. So I did this with a representative sample from Qualtrics panels. This is about 500 subjects. And I think this is really fascinating because I'm trying to now get at what are the abilities of, of gay men and lesbian women? Like we have this idea of their gender inversion, but just because a gay man, for example, has more feminine preferences doesn't mean that he loses the ability to do the more masculine things that uh, is ascribed to him because of his gender. Here, it seems like everybody just loses everything. Like gay men and lesbian women are just assumed to just be the least successful, that they don't actually have the competencies compared to their straight counterparts. So that is how I'm seeing this. And then I can just pretty much end uh, and then we can take questions. Here's my um, email address if anyone wants to ask me questions since we only have a few more minutes. But thank you for listening.